the Spirit of God hovered over the waters at the moment of creation. Like the universe exploding outward from the single spark of God's Word, so the church became real. Put your hand on the ground. The earth itself is vibrating. The mountains, the oceans, the deserts, the creatures that live here are all breathing in. The planet is inhaling. Imagine the song it will sing, the song of Pentecost. Joy enveloped the disciples. Their words were understood and welcomed. Their joy was contagious. Their message was heard and translated and shared. The church moved into the world, bringing light, bringing love, covering all there was. There was no denying it. There was no going back. The church as we know it was born. God, we feel your presence. Let us use it. Let us take this rush, this moment, this Pentecost, shouting into a world that is bored stiff by life. We have been made aware of the presence of the creator of the universe. Give us the strength to keep it going. God is real. The church is born. The song goes on and everyone can sing. Amen. Well, good morning, church. After that video, I hope that you'll join me in worshiping our God. You would take my place 
Good morning, church. Pastor Trevor here, and I want to say thank you for joining us in worship this morning. Our hope and prayer is that you would experience the power of Christ, that you would know how much God loves you, and that you would feel the Holy Spirit moving this morning, this Pentecost morning, this morning that we celebrate the the birth of the church. We celebrate the Holy Spirit being poured out on the disciples. I want to invite you to Share this video uh, with someone uh, this morning. Share it on your Facebook or text the YouTube link, whatever it may be. Uh, I truly believe that God is going to do something powerful uh, in, in this morning's worship service, that God has a word for each of us. So I invite you to share that with someone. But would you pray with me? Gracious God, we gathered this morning uh, to open our lives up to you, to, to, to say, God, we need more of you, that holy fire pour down on us, that, that God, we want your Holy Spirit in and among us, that we want to follow you more and more. So God, breathe in your church today. Let there be hearts put on fire for you. Let there be revival here in your land and in our communities of Leander and Cedar Park. Let people come to love you more and more each and every day. But let this worship service be a place where that starts. God, we pray all this in your son's name. Amen. Well, as we continue in worship today, I thought it would be a good idea for us to, uh, as we continue in our Hall of Fame series, uh, do some songs that were our Hall of Famers, so to speak, uh, in terms of worship music. And uh, in case y'all haven't been aware, we've been doing a worship bracket challenge um, where we've done kind of a March Madness bracket of worship songs of different genres and styles. And so I thought I'd share two of those with us today, uh, that we could worship to two of those songs that I feel like really speak to um, the heart of worship in, in significant ways, although we won't be doing the song Heart of Worship. So... <laughs> We're going to sing uh, Come Thou Fount and also uh, How He Loves. So. Come Thou Fount of every blessing to my heart to sing thy praise streams of mercy never ceasing call for songs of loudest praise teach me some melodious sonnet sung by flaming tongues above Praise the mount, I'm fixed upon it. Mountains I redeeming love. Here I raise mine Ebenezer, his by thy help I and I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. Jesus sought me when a stranger wandering from the fold of God. He to rescue me from danger interposed his precious blood and oh to grace how great a debtor daily i'm constrained to be let thy goodness like a fetter Find my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord, 
take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. jealous for me he loves like a hurricane i am a tree bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy when all of a sudden i am unaware of these afflictions eclipsed by glory and i realize just how Beautiful you are and how great your affections are for me And oh, how he loves us Oh, oh, how he loves us How he loves us jealous for me. He is jealous for me. He loves like a hurricane. I am a tree bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy. When all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions eclipsed by He loves us oh.
Oh, how He loves us. Oh, how He loves. Hello, everyone. Happy Sunday. Would you all please join me in a moment of prayer? Lord, Father, as we move through this uncertain time that we're currently in, Lord, we ask that you rest your spirit with all of us. For our first responders, Lord, we pray that you have your spirit of courage and wisdom and strength to continue to move forward, to continue helping people, and to continue pushing the will of your kingdom forward, Lord, by helping others. For those afflicted with this virus, Lord, I pray that you lend your spirit of peace with them, spirit of comfort. Lord, for those who feel alone and isolated, I pray, Lord, that you lend your spirit of patience and peace as well. Help them understand, Lord, that they're not alone in the dark, that you, Lord, are a light. As we're here in these quarantine times together with our families, Lord, we pray that we use this time wisely to build bonds better between our families and build bonds with you, God. May we continue to strive to move towards your kingdom and to seek out your will, Lord. Pray all this in the way your son taught us to pray, Lord, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Well, hello, Good News Faith family. I am so excited to be with you in worship today. Uh, my name is Jackson, and I serve on staff at White's Chapel UMC in South Lake as one of their worship leaders. But um, Austin Taylor is one of my best friends, and I am very honored to be in worship with you guys today. I've been, uh, I've watched many times online just to watch my buddy, but also um, just to be in worship with y'all. And I gotta say, I love it. I love everything you guys are doing. Um, congrats on surviving COVID and um, making it through. Obviously, we're still in it, but. Um, I think we have all adjusted so well. And so I'm excited to be with you in this platform today. So we're gonna have some fun. Um, I'm gonna sing for you one of my favorite hymns today, which is a song called I Surrender All. If you know the words, I encourage you to sing along, but I will be doing it just a little differently than you might have heard before. So without further ado, let's jump in. Born in Jesus, I surrender my free
to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. Amen. Well, we're continuing, or really we're finishing up our sermon series for May called Hall of Fame, where we've been looking at uh, these Hall of Famers of faith in Hebrews chapter 11. They're kind of listed out as a, a faith Hall of Fame. And really what we've been asking is, what does it look like to have our lives shaped by Christ? What does it look like to live a life of faith? And that these people, have, these uh, characters, these uh, historical figures have been used as sources of inspiration of what does it look like for you and I to live faithfully today. We started this series out by uh, looking at the definition of faith in Hebrews 11, beginning in verse 1. Hear it again. Faith is the reality of what we hope for, the proof of what we don't see. Hear it again. Faith is the reality of what we hope for, the proof of what we don't see. The author of Hebrews gives us a definition of faith, a definition that really kind of takes imagination and courage. You see, we've got to imagine what God wants for us, what God's ideal for the world is, and then we've got to have the courage to step into it, to hope for it, to live into that faith. I can hear you already. Okay, okay, Pastor Trevor, that's great, uh, but I'm never going to get there. Right? Like these people are Bible people. They're supposed to be people of faith, but what about me here and now in Cedar Park and Leander? I'm never going to get there. And yet the end of chapter 11, moving into chapter 12, the author flips the switch. He moves the light from on these Hall of Famers to you and I. Scripture becomes about you and me. Here in chapter 12, beginning in verse 1. So then, let's also run the race that is laid out in front of us. Most translations probably say, therefore, let's run the race that is set before us. Since we have such a great cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let's throw off any extra baggage, get rid of the sin that trips us up and fix our eyes on Jesus, faith's pioneer and perfecter. He endured the cross, ignoring the shame for the sake of the joy that was laid out in front of him and sat down at the right hand of God's throne. The author of Hebrews continues this sports metaphor and ends with this kind of image of a race. He, he's, the, the, the author has kind of switched the, like we were saying, switched the focus from these Hall of Famers to us. And we'll talk a little more about that switch here in a second, but the reality he's trying to communicate to us is that we all have a race we're running. We all have a race we're running. We all have something in life that we're pursuing, that we're chasing after. For some of us, that might be a more prestigious job or something. For some of us, we're chasing money. For some of us, we're chasing kind of this future for our children. Whatever it may be, we all have a race we're running. He's clear about that. But the thing he wants us to notice is he uses this kind of running language. Why? I don't know how many of y'all are runners. I'm clearly not. Uh, but runners have this thing where they're not necessarily competing against those on their left and right. They're competing against themselves. That they, they, They're competing against a better time than they ran before. And that's the same in faith. The race we're running is not a competition against these people to our left and to our right. In and, and, and life of faith, it's easy to get distracted by them. It's easy to get jealous of their own experience or say, wow, they're much further along. Or look at those people, they're way behind me. But it's not about that. In fact, I, I, I remember the picture, maybe y'all remember it from the Olympics. Just, uh, Justin Gatlin, as he's running, he, he turns to the side. A big no-no in racing for 
comfort slows you down. It distracts you. The race you're running is, is about you, not someone else. It's about you competing against the different versions of yourself that you might become. And the author of uh, Hebrews has been setting this up of all these hall of famers, of using these examples with the hope that they would be inspiration for us to run the race well. That we would hear the difficulties they faced, that we would hear about their endurance, that we would recognize God's faithfulness in the midst of it. And the author of Hebrews gives us three things about running this race we should be aware of. The first is this, is that we need to recognize that we have a cloud of witnesses. This is where we're going to talk about that switch that the author makes, that therefore that he, he flips the switch. And these people, that, these Hall of Famers that we've been watching, that we've been talking about, they become the cloud of witnesses. This word cloud is a literary kind of term that they would have used at the time that means crowd or group of spectators. All these heroes, these Hall of Famers of faith are now watching you and me and cheering us on. The saints are cheering us on. And I don't think it's just the biblical saints, which that's humbling in of itself. But I think the saints that have gone before us are cheering us on. The saints who have poured into us, the saints who have made us who we are, the saints who have taught us, the saints who have pulled us along in life, they are cheering us us on. We need to recognize, we need to realize that we are standing on the shoulders of giants. We have a great cloud of witnesses cheering us on. We have the saints cheering us on. And I, I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but I've found myself recently telling people that and when I'm thanking them or when I see that they are doing something as a faithful person, calling them a saint much to their chagrin, I kind of get embarrassed about it, but I truly believe that there are saints in and among our midst, that there are saints all around us. There are people following Christ and shining the light of shining hope in a world around us. There are people loving their neighbor and loving God so desperately that they're showing us what it means to live faithfully. Just this week as I watched the horrific news, I thought of a regular everyday saint who has gone down in the history books. A woman named Rosa Parks. When asked about why she wouldn't give up her seat on the bus, she said she was simply just tired of being pushed around, that she saw every person having value. That her people were not less than. Miss Parks took a bold step of faith in an everyday action. She showed us what it means to live a life of faith. She showed us that she lived out what she believed. I think we often think of saints as these perfect people that have it all together, and yet this Hall of Fame list of saints that we've been studying, they are less than perfect people. David was an adulterer. Rahab, who we talked about last week, who's lifted up as a saint, who's listed in Jesus' genealogy, is a prostitute. Moses is a coward. Part of being a church, part of being a part of a church is not that we have it all figured out, but that we've surrounded us ourselves with saints, people who are encouraging us and cheering us on and, and directing us and saying, you've got it, go after it, pursue what God is calling you. The question is, who is cheering you on? Who's formed you? Who are in the, your cloud of witnesses cheering you on? And the second part of that is, who are you cheering on? Who are you a saint for? Who are you in the crowd for? The second thing that we see in Scripture this morning is that we have got to get rid of sin. 
We've got to get rid of sin. I'm going to be real honest and brutal this morning. You and I have a sin problem. We can try and pretend like we don't. We can act like we've got everything honky-dory, that everything is perfect, but we have a sin problem. And this morning, it's hard to pray that the Holy Spirit would breathe in and through her church when there are people crying out in the streets that they can't breathe. And that's just one problem we have. That's just one. We could name all the problems that we have, but the reality is, is that we need to confess. We need to admit that we are broken people, that we have a sin problem, and we've got to get rid of it. We can't fix the world. We can't just cry out and bemoan these problems until we fix the inside, until we fix our heart, until we confess and admit the ways that we are implicit in the sinful systems, until we admit our own brokenness, our own individual brokenness, we can't fix the world. We've got to get rid of sin. John Wesley, when talking about the scripture, so aptly put, he says, get rid of all that damps the vigor of your soul. Get rid of that that doesn't allow you to love your neighbor or love God. Just get rid of it. Get rid of it. It's crazy here on Pentecost that we celebrate the birth of the church, the, the, a new beginning in humanity. We celebrate the pouring out of the Holy Spirit uh, uh, seen through tongues of fire on people's heads. And we have this week juxtaposed against this Sunday. And I wonder if the Holy Spirit, if she's speaking to the church and saying, get rid of your divisions, break down your false assumptions of people until you see those people as my friends, until you see them as beloved children of God, you won't experience the power of Christ. See, the crazy thing about Pentecost, the fire of tongues raining down from heaven, is not that it burns anything up. In fact, it doesn't. It doesn't leave any ash or destruction in its wake, but instead it creates something new. The baptism of fire creates a new family based in who Christ is, based in what Christ has done for you and me. It says that all are created as beloved children of God, you, me, and George Floyd, that all of us are beloved children of God. Remember, Galatians, chapter 3, verse 27. All of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you all are one in Christ. Living as if that's not true. It's an abomination to the Holy Spirit. Not recognizing your brother and sister as daughters and sons of the beloved king. Not seeing their inherent value. Allowing sin to corrupt our, the way we see people is an abomination to the work of Christ. We can't live into what God is calling us to. We can't live faithfully until we see people as God sees them, until we get rid of our sin. You see, racism does not have a place in the family of Christ. No, racism does not have a place in the world. Why? Because God redeemed the world, and you and I need to be people. We need to be agents of that freedom experienced in Christ. Get rid of the sin. The words that haunted me this week were from the mayor of Minneapolis. Being black in America should not be a death sentence. We need to get rid of anything that damps the vigor of our soul and does not allow us to love God or our neighbor. The third thing, you and I need to admit, we need to see that we're being coached by Christ. 
the author of Hebrews has set the scene. We've got these crowd of witnesses, the, the, these people cheering us on, and we're placed on this track. But the only thing missing is the coach. Behind every great athlete is a great coach. I think of Phil Jackson behind both Kobe Bryant and Michael Jordan was Phil Jackson, almost this mastermind, pushing them forward, helping them reach their potential. You see, coaches help make us better. They push us harder than we would ever push ourselves. They help us reach our potential. They open up doors. They help us see things that we don't see. If we want to become all world at whatever we want to do, we've got to get closer to the coach. I think of Tim Duncan and Coach Popovich, as much as it pains me as a Dallas Maverick fan, Tim Duncan and Coach Popovich had this relationship that made Tim Duncan great. If you and I want to get great at our faith, if we want to be Hall of Famers, if we want to be world difference makers, if we want to change just even our family, if we want to change ourselves, we've got to get close to the coach. We've got to spend time with the coach who is Christ. It's no wonder that coaching is a buzzword in our world. Financial coach, a personal coach, a life coach, a physical coach, right? All these coaching things. Why? Because subconsciously we recognize that greatness is not an accident. This is the climax of this um, sports metaphor that the author of Hebrews is trying to make. That Christ is the pioneer. He's the ultimate coach. He's gone before us. He's lived through this, and yet he wants to show us a better way to run the race. He wants to show us a better way to be human, a better way to love our neighbors and ourselves. Obviously, I'm not much of a runner, but marathon runners hire coaches often. And, and the coaches, sure, during the training, they set up kind of running plans, and I know this because Danielle's done some of this right, and um, that they're there on race day to cheer them along, but one of the new phenomenon that is happening with these uh, marathon coaches is about seven mile 17, mile 18, uh, marathon runners say they kind of hit a wall. And what happens is the marathon coach then will actually hop into the race about that mile and run with them, encouraging them and, and pushing them along, supporting them. This is what Christ is doing. Christ wants to enter into our lives and support us and run with us and run alongside of us and even carry us if we can't make it. Are you pulling close to the coach and allowing the coach to define your run? We all have a choice. What are you running towards? What are you racing towards? Are you willing to get rid of that which may hold you back? And who is coaching you? Whose voice are you listening to? Or are you even listening to a voice? Would you pray with me? Gracious God, it's in this moment that we are aware of our need for you, not just Lord of our lives, but a Savior. Someone who can make the way open for us. Someone who can, we can confess our sin and who can take it on for us. And then can show us a better way. So God, certainly we pray for revival. But we pray that it starts in each of us. Be with us. Convict us. Change us. So that we might be saints to our communities and our neighborhoods, to our friends and family. Pray all this in your son's name. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. I hope that you'll join me in closing with this song.
Before I spoke a word, you were singing over me. You have been so, so good to me. Before I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. You have been so, so kind to me. And oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found. These the 99, and I couldn't earn it. I don't deserve it. Still, you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of God. Yeah. Your fool, still your love fought for me. And you have been so, so good to me. When I felt the worth, you paid it all for me. You have been so, so kind to me. God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves to 99. And I couldn't earn it, and I don't deserve it. Still, you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never ending, reckless. Mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. No shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down. Thanks for joining us in worship.
I hope that you experience Christ in this. That you are reminded of who God called us, who God made us to be. That you would be inspired to maybe take a step of faith and to love your neighbor as you love yourself. As you go this week, we say it every week, but I want you to know that God goes with you. That sometimes taking a step of faith is not an easy thing to do, but know that the living God goes with you. The Christ figure, the one who defeated the power of sin and darkness, the one who says this is not the end, goes with you this morning and goes with you each and every day. God goes up in front of you and behind you. God goes on your right and on your left. God goes above you and below you. God surrounds you as you go. So go. Go to run the race and eventually hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. Go to write your name in the hall of fame of faith. Go in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.